Today, we are going to review the old story known as The Miser and His Gold. This is one of Aesop's fables, and although it was first told long ago, it still applies today. It's about a man who buries his gold in a hole in the ground. What could possibly go wrong there? You are about to listen to an episode of Dolphin Financial Radio. Each week, co-hosts Dan and Tony will explore topics about finance and retirement. It's fun, informative, and most of all useful to those who are interested in retiring successfully. Now, let's begin the show. Hello and welcome to another Dolphin Financial Radio show. I'm Dan Wendell and alongside me is Tony Shore. We are going to talk about the miser and his gold, Tony. Have you heard this fable? It's Aesop's fable, or it was one of Aesop's fable. Who is Aesop, by the way? Do we have you met this guy? <laughs> I'm not that old. I love Aesop's fables, <laughs> and I learned all about Aesop uh, and and all his fables uh, in school and in uh, literature class. But you know what? I forgot what he is. He's like a Greek philosopher and writer, or. I forget who he was, oh. uh, but he's definitely born BC, right? He's a BC guy. Uh, no, I don't think it's that no. old, is it? Maybe. I think you know, so. these fables. I the fables so, yeah. are great, though. Uh, I love his fables. So I, I, the man and his gold. I, I, you know, I've read them all, and that's very familiar to me. But I don't remember exactly how it goes. Maybe you could help us if you're going to use it as an analogy. Why don't you read it for us, and uh, then we'll uh, talk about it, because it's short, isn't it? Yeah, it's short. I'll read it. It's um, and I'm getting I'm getting this from read.gov. So this is, you know, even the government thinks this is a good story, but maybe it's just because it's short. <laughs> but I should uh, tell you, I'm going to read this to my kids tonight too to see what they think about it. But um, okay, it's called the miser. Let's go. <laughs> a miser had buried his gold in a secret place in his garden. Every day he went to the spot, dug up the treasure, and counted it piece by piece to make sure it was all there. He made so many trips that a thief, who had been observing him, guessed what it was that the miser had hidden, and one night quietly dug up the treasure and made off with it. When the miser discovered his loss, he was overcome with grief and despair. He groaned and cried and tore his hair. A passerby heard his cries and asked, what had happened? My God! Oh, my gold! Oh, my gold! cried the miser wildly. Someone has robbed me! Your gold? There in that hole? Why did you put it there? Why did you not keep it in the house where it could be easily get it, where you can easily get it when you had things you wanted to buy? Buy? screamed the miser angrily. Why, I never touched the gold. I couldn't think of spending any of it. The stranger picked up a large stone and threw it in the hole. If that's the case, he said, cover up that stone. It's worth just as much to you as the treasure you lost. Ah. And that's the miser in his love gold. It. I love it. That's a great analogy. So, what's the lesson here, Tony? What I mean, what is your take on this one? Well, obviously, if... He you never touch your money. You can say, look at, I made this much in the stocks. And if you never touch it and you leave it in there until you're 80 years old, even if it's grown and grown, even if you're way ahead, it doesn't matter because it, it could just as well be play money in a monopoly game because you're not using it for anything. You never, you're not touching yeah, it. Yeah. It's just like putting money under the mattress and you feel good just knowing it's there, but you're never going to use it. Uh, then it doesn't matter. It has no value. It devalues That's the money. Right. Yeah. Right. Unused wealth isn't really wealth. Ah, that. Unused there you wealth. Go. Yeah. You know, uh, we can, you can make a lesson about counting your money and being greedy and miserly. You know, that's the term miser is not a good one. <laughs> no, right? no, uh, no. It's I like, not. The, you know, you be, like to be called frugal. My, my Some of my friends call me cheap, <laughs> but they don't call me a miser. I guess to be a miser, you actually have to have money. <laughs> right. right. To count. I don't have money Right, to like count. Scrooge. He was so, a miser. <laughs> Scrooge right, liked to right. count his money. 
Right. So counting money and holding it just to have it isn't really a smart no. thing to do. Right. Do people really hoard gold anymore? Do you think people, some, uh, you, you, you know, know, there's some people out there hoarding gold. You know that <laughs> literally, too, yeah, right? literally they, go, like literal gold. gold and they hoard it. They buy it and they hoard it. You think they bury it in their backyard? I have, I think, I think people still do that too. There's probably a few people out in there backyard. that are crazy enough. I mean, there's always somebody out there. I, I don't think too many people are burying anything of value these days. But you you know that we say you never say never nowadays because there's crazies. You know, you gotta account. You gotta well, account you know, for with, those guys. With with the pandemic, you know, there's going to be people that are buying gold, physical gold, to say, well, you know, when the oh, economy yeah. collapses and you need food, you're going to come to me because I'm going to give you gold. I have gold bars. I'm like, what are you going to do, shave it? You're going to, like, shave little pieces of gold off and give it to me? Like, you know, so <laughs> the idea of having giant pieces. If you have coins, maybe. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> I think today people don't bury gold, but what they do is they hoard cash in their checking account. Or like you said, they have it under the mattress. That's the same True. thing. I think I think the they, kind of they more yep. hoard it in uh, in um, yeah a, certain types of accounts. You know, it's like I know a lot of elderly right. people who have CDs because they believed in mm-hmm. them from back in the day when they actually made money on CDs on interest. But now you don't. Right. But they still it's safe. It's safe. I'm just going to keep it in there. It's safe. Um, I have a couple relatives like that. And it's just like, you know, you lived your whole life and you got all this money in CDs. You have no idea what you're going to do with it. And you've never spent it. And you've been so frugal. And And it's like, it's the depression era. You know, I look at people who went through that depression era, era, like my grandfather and my mother-in-law, both uh, their families. My my grandfather, my grandpa, sure. um, He's very frugal. I mean, he, he, and he has money from farming, but no one knows how much. No one knows how much. Uh, he owns a lot of land. You got to say, Grandpa, where are you burying yeah, the gold? Exactly. Where are you burying the gold, Exactly. Grandpa? Just tell me that before exactly. you go. <laughs> but he's not a, he's, he's definitely not a soon, miser, right? though. But he is, he is, he would, you know, uh, he will fix something or do something on his own before, you know, he never hires anything done because it's too expensive. He does it himself. And that's right. how he learned to do everything himself. And everybody's blown away by how skilled he is. And that's part of it. So there are advantages there. But yeah, I w- I w- my grandpa's definitely not a miser. So, How old is he now? 99. He'll turn 100 yeah, in February. Of 2021? Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's awesome. I, I remind, it reminds me of a story of, not a story, it's something that happened when I was just out of college. My couple of years out of college, I went back home to play in a poker game and I picked up one of my friends at the train station because he was living in Manhattan and he was going to play with us. So I picked him up at the train station. He's like, oh, I got to go to the ATM to get cash. So we go up to a drive in ATM because it's at night and, um, you know, I'm driving. So you can't I couldn't I had to be the one to put the ATM card in. So he gives me the ATM card. He tells me his PIN number, which, you know, we were good friends, so that wasn't the issue. And then he says, I want a couple hundred dollars or whatever it was at the time. They made a hundred dollars. Give me a hundred. And then he said, um, can you give me a balance check? And I look and I'm like, what? come on, what do I look? You know, so I have to press the button. This is when you had to like press the oh, button yeah. to ask yeah. for the balance. And then, um, and he's like, what, you know? And so I get him, he prints it out and I hand it to him. And he's like, what, what does it say? I'm like, what are you, what is this? What are you doing? And he's like, look at it. And I look at it and he had like, I think $180,000 <laughs> in, in his a checking, checking account. In a checking account. <clears throat> in his checking oh. account. So I look at him and I look at this and he's just sitting there smiling. He has got this grin on his face staring at me. And, you know, we're playing quarter bets, you know, quarter 50 yeah. cent dollar. And uh, he's got this and I look at him and I'm like, and you know, the first thing that came across my face my, when I said to him, why do you have this in checking, you idiot? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? And so he was a day trader. So he was trading stocks, you know, and he did well. And I went and go work with him um, after that. But um, amazing that he had this cash in there. And he's always been, like, that way. He's always been, like, smart about gambling. And he's the guy that would win in poker always. Be- but 
because he wouldn't take any unnecessary risks, yeah. you know? And I'm like, you, you idiot, you know? So he, so what is he supposed to do? But I still got, I still have clients that do that. I still have clients today that are in their fifties, sixties, seventies. They have a lot in cash. Um, they like to keep it in CDs, like you said. And so what's the alternative? Like I said to him, what are you doing? He was probably 20, I don't know. 21 22 at that at that point when when we did this and he had it in checking now he just wanted to show me because he was proud of himself he probably you know he was since went on to invest that money and buy you know i think he bought apartment and real estate in, in manhattan and so forth but at the time i was like you're an idiot but i look at this and i see a lot of clients with a lot of cash and i often give clients a lot of more cash than they want and so you get people that love it. And then you get the people on the flip side, Tony, that say, I don't want this much in cash. Uh, it's too much. It's too much in cash. And it's not because they're afraid they're going to spend it. It's just they don't feel like it's working for them. They want it working. They want it to be invested, which is the opposite of what the miser was doing. The miser was burying it and counting it and loving it for what it was. Whereas some people that's, that have that much in cash can't they get emotionally unstable because they don't feel like they're making enough money on that cash so it can go both ways wow that's a good point so the question is what are you supposed to do with that with your money you know is it really bad that um your grandfather likes to have cds as an example is that a bad thing? no not not not, nec- least not necessarily something. i mean uh, you know it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're not having it just to have it, you know, that's a bit, you know, that's the greed thing. I, I can't spend it because I want to keep it, but yet it's money, so it's worthless if, you know, if you if you don't do anything with it. Now, there's the other flip side. If you're keeping it to give to your loved ones after you're gone and you're happy and comfortable living the way you are, that's one thing. But you're, you're also losing. There's opportunity loss. That's why we always talk about, you've said before, Dan, you don't want to put your money under the mattress because you're missing out on growth, right? And and you're getting eaten up right. by inflation, you know. And then there's opportunity costs. What could you exactly. be doing with that money? You know, my m- one of the popular videos I have on YouTube is uh, me interviewing my parents, and and this is before my mom died. She was really adamant about saying, and my dad too, um, spend your money while you're young, not. Not frivolously, but, you know, enjoy it while you can, because eventually you'll get to the point where you can't do the things you want to do. And but it's easy for them to say, because my parents weren't miserly, they were very frugal, but they both had pensions. My dad was an an English teacher in high school. My mom worked for the IRS. And so her pension covered health insurance and his pension covered the living expenses. So they had saved. They, They were miserly in that they had pensions right so they were able to then spend their other money now if they just hoarded that money and for the the four boys me included we wouldn't want that but they went and spent it they enjoyed it and that that's great so there's a balance i think it's all comes down to a balance but like you said maybe you want to leave it to the next generation and that's okay too um did but you don't hear bury about it in your backyard Chuck... or put it under your mattress, and maybe you don't even <laughs> want to put it in a CD. There are sa- pretty safe accounts where you could put it, where you'll at least get some interest. Right. And you know one thing, like leaving it to the next generation, an easy solution to that, say you have $100,000 you want to leave to your grandkids. You can buy a $100,000 life insurance policy and name your grandkids as the beneficiaries. I wouldn't if they were under 18, but say your kids <laughs> right. or someone or your yeah. charity, right? Um, you buy that. I wouldn't pay if they're for under it, 30. And you add that as an exp- <laughs> Well, you can <laughs> specify that. You yeah. can use trusts. There's a yeah. lot of estate planning tactics you could do. But um, you buy the life insurance and you pay for it and you and then the rest of your money you spend on yourself. So you you could do both. Right. You don't have to just hoard it and keep it in in under the pillow and give it to the kids. Now, it's nice to give cash and have it when you're ready. But you're right. You don't want to just hoard it. You have. I think the key is you have to have a purpose for your money. You have to have a purpose for money. The the purpose of that money. Right. If it's if it's just to be there to count, that's not a very good. Then you might as well have a rock in a hole. 
You might as thank you, there Aesop. It there it is. You, you might genius. as well just thanks, Aesop. <laughs> thanks, Aesop. Who is Aesop? Is Aesop even a person, or is it just like a collective? No, like, it was a person. Th- you know, I don't think it's a person. I don't think that's proven. I mean, we're talking BC. It could just no, be like a he was. A, he was. A, he was called and, a Greek fabulist. Mm. Yep. Fabulous. Well, there are statues wow. of him. <laughs> Oh, curly okay. hair, curly beard. Um, he was a storyteller f- cre- credited with a number of fables now collectively known as Aesop's fables. Yeah, he's from 564 okay. BC. You were right on that one. Yeah, from, BC. From Delphi, BC. Pr- from Delphi, it, Greece. Lived to died at age 56. <laughs> That's pretty good. Wow, Tony, you're yeah. getting there. See? Lifespan's improved since then, I guess. But some of his t- tales have lasted a lot longer than he did. Oh, I'll tell you yeah. that, and longer than ever than we ever will. Did you um, did you hear the this about this guy Chuck Feeney? Have you heard recently? He's been in the news. Yeah, Chuck I heard Feeney, that name. Yeah, Charles. Um, he's eighty nine, and he was the co-founder of Duty Free yes, Shopping. Yeah, you know those things yeah. the airports. Did you? So I read a recent article about him, but I had not. I didn't know anything about this guy, and then turns out. He had about eight billion, give or take a few hundred million <laughs> of wealth. You know, he had eight billion with a B and he gave it all away. He gave it all away while he was alive. And he gave it away anonymously. And he kept about two million for him and his wife to live off of. Now, two million is not, nothing to blink at, but when you have eight billion, two million is pennies, really. You know, he could make two billion. Two million on and a CD in a half a month, you know, of an eight billion. So, um, he gave all of his money away recently, and now he doesn't have any more money to give. But here's here's something he said: I see little reason t- to delay giving when so much good can be achieved through supporting worthwhile causes. Besides, it's a lot more fun to give while you live than to give while you're dead. Wow. Yeah, he gave so, he gave so away case, more than eight billion dollars, and that was revealed in 1997. And he's the mm-hmm. founder of the largest private private charitable foundation in the world, the Atlantic Philanthropies. Easy for me. And I me think to say. that that the Atlantic Philanthropies is is gone now. I think or yeah, it's spent they everything. gave it all away. It's right. And Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, they came up with this charitable um what is it uh to give money away um yeah i I forget the name of it but it was it was it was inspired by this guy chuck feeney which is amazing so this guy he had a purpose for his money he figured you know he wasn't miserly that's for sure he didn't want to keep it just to count he gave it away now he could have spent it on himself and i wouldn't plus he has five kids he could have they get he could have given to it. Maybe he did. Maybe he gave some to the family. But regardless, he did yeah. something with it. I think that's you know? great. And and you know, so so really, what 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 do we learn from this? I, I like I said, I think you have to have a purpose. But what's a good balance? You know, what do you do? Is it miserly to have thirty thousand in your checking account at all times? I don't think well, so. It's perspective. I think too. it depends you know, you, on how much money you have. Exactly. That's a good point. So, you know, you need three to six months of emergency funds. I think the COVID-19 crisis, people losing their job, people realizing, wow, emergency fund is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so in hindsight, that's not being miserly. lots of Americans right? woke up and said, hey, I should have had an emergency fund, right? Right, right. And that's what it's for. So you have that cash for an emergency, not to just count, but to, in case something happens. It's important to get rid of debts. I have, I, I run into people all the time that have money in their savings. They're excited about it. They're proud of it. They can count it. But they're sitting on a credit card debt at 12, yeah, 15, that's, that's 20%. that's crazy stupid. Right. So that's not intelligent in terms of financial literacy, um, but it makes them feel good to have the money in the checking, right? So you get this feeling. So that's not that's not what you should be doing with it. You should have a purpose for the money. The purpose should be to pay off that debt. Um, but once you have money, you should then come up with your goal. And that could be giving it away like Feeney did. You could be saving for retirement. It could be college funding and raising kids like we do, right? It could be a major purchase. I want to buy a new laptop or I want to give to charity. Whatever it is, you should have an investment goal. You should match 
your goal with your investment strategy. You should have a plan for your money and match it with what you're trying to accomplish. Don't just sit on it because otherwise, like you said, you might as well just have a rock right. instead of money. Because really, what are you? Good advice. Uh, have a purpose for your money, and uh, you know you always hear. Put your money to work for you. Each dollar should have a purpose, and I think that's a great uh, a great point. Exactly. So we'll pick on people that don't have a purpose, but we won't pick on people's purposes. I'm not going to uh, say that he's better for giving it away to charity than he is to give it to his family or to spend it on himself lavishly. I- I'm not there to judge. But if he just sat on it and counted it like Scrooge, then I'd have a problem with that, and then I might judge. But again, um, I can judge because I don't live in a glass house when it comes to being miserly. I don't have the money to count. So, <laughs> But, you know, if I ever get there, I'm hoping. Tony, if I ever get to the point where you see me counting my money greedily, smack me. You have permission. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, you're never going to be like that because you know the lesson of the miser. So, Plus, I have three yeah, kids. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble right there. So. I'm spending money and I don't even know oh, it right now. Yeah. Wait, you have a wife and kids? Yeah, your money is flying out the door at this point. What you need is a, also yeah, so, do you have a very large dog because that also helps with money. Yeah, did you hear him? He's barking in the distance. <laughs> uh, recording yeah, from rascal. our home studios today, I hear. Um, yes. I yeah, am, we are. We are. Uh, well, great show today, Dan. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? No, big lesson, Aesop's Fables. Read it to your kids. Read it to the grandkids. Teach them that keeping money for no purpose is not valuable. You know, I, I'm going to report back in the future what my kids think of the story, and I'm going to let them come up with their own conclusions and see what they say. But it's worth thinking about. If you're sitting on cash and you don't know what to do, invest it or don't. But if you're not going to invest it, spend it or give it away. Don't just sit on it. It doesn't help anyone. Of course, unless you need an emergency fund, then it's good to keep it on the side. But you know what I'm talking about. Have a purpose. And if you need help figuring out what your purpose is, give me a call. I'll help you talk about different strategies to give it away or to invest it or to spend it. Um, that's, That's always my default is spend it on yourself. Why not? You can't take it with you. So again, thanks for a good show, Tony. And if you need to get in touch with me, the easiest way, just go to dolphinfinancialgroup.com. Thanks for a good show, Tony. All right. Thanks, Dan. Great show. And listeners, that does it for today's episode of Dolphin Financial Radio with our host, Dan Wynn. The topics on this show are wide ranging, yet relevant to people approaching or living in retirement like me. If there is a topic you want to hear on the show, head to dolphinfinancialgroup.com and contact Dan to request your topic or to share your opinion. Dan Wendell or Dolphin Financial Group are not affiliated or endorsed by Social Security or any government agency. Everything discussed on today's show was for informational purpose only. Since everyone's situation is different, some things may not apply to you. The materials presented are believed to be from reliable sources. We cannot be 100% certain that they are accurate. You should really talk to my dad or someone from Dolphin Financial Group before trying to implement these ideas or strategies.